Welcome in, everybody. It is time for the 212th episode of Three Guys Before the Game with a very special guest, Mountaineer Hall of Famer, Mountaineer All-American, Brian Joswiak is on deck and heading to the plate. Welcome in, everybody. Three Guys Before the Game with the Senator, Brad Howe. I'm Tony Caridi, and Three Guys Before the Game is brought to you by, well, you probably know this by now, Burdett Camping Center. They're the only warranty forever RV dealer in all of West Virginia. Visit them at burdettcamping.com. And by Comax Business Systems, your full-service Konica Minolta dealer. Go to Comax Business Systems at comaxwv.com. Why, you may ask? Because in football terms, they're the Heisman Trophy winner when it comes to managed IT and managed voice services. Only one dealer in the state of West Virginia has ever earned the elite status honor from ENX Magazine, and that is, you filled in the blank right there, you knew it, didn't you? It was Comax Business Systems, 24-7 remote monitoring, gives you the peace of mind that you need to have, knowing that they always have your networks back. So if you're in the business world, you need managed IT, you need managed voice, check out Comax Business Systems at comaxwv.com. Last episode, which would be 211, we went hoopage with Darius Nichols. Had a fun time with Darius. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the program. I, let me think here how to put this in the proper perspective. I would say one of the most iconic members of the West Virginia University football team in the last 40 years. Last 40 years, this guy, if you're going to say, give me iconic figures, it would be Brian Joswiak for a bunch of different reasons. Number one, just physical size. You don't get that big and be that big and throw in the fact that he did have a Mohawk his senior year without being an an iconic thing. Throw in consensus All-American. Throw in seventh pick of the NFL draft. Throw in that he was a member of that 84 team that beat BC and Flutie and Penn State and Syracuse, took TCU, corked them around, all of those things. Welcome to the program, Brian Joswiak. Well, thank you. Gentlemen, I appreciate you having me. And, Tony, I, to say that, I'm, I'm all a goose bumbling. I appreciate that because <laughs> I'll tell you what, we've had some iconic figures throughout the years. Uh, all the way back to the very beginning of Mountaineer football, and and to be to be said in that group, uh, it's an honor. I appreciate, it. and you should know because you know. I mean, you're you're our modern voice of the Mountaineers. I yeah, mean, you know, and, and it's and you're an icon. So thanks for having me on the show. Well, it's my pleasure. Let's and by go. the way, in my copious amount of research that I've done in preparation for the show. Happy early birthday. You got a birthday Saturday, don't you, big boy? Uh, you know what? I sure do. And and I'll tell you what, with that, I'm going to wish West Virginia a happy 157. <laughs> uh, you know, I was I was born on West Virginia's centennial birthday. I'll be 57. And, and yeah. uh, you know, I didn't even realize that until I was like a junior in college. <laughs> but honest to goodness, it, it's kind of like a, a it, it's kind of like this, like fate brought me to West Virginia and uh it's it's considered uh my home definitely home away from home and buddy I can't wait to get up there in July that's for sure yeah we're going to talk about that uh and that speaking of milestones 57th birthday 30th annual Brian Joswiak celebrity golf tournament which has been raising dollars for WV Medicine the Children's Hospital and now that's we got a whole bunch of stuff to get into along that as well. First off first, before we even go backward, let's go a little forward here. Bring folks up to date with what it is that you are doing now. You're staying in the game, have stayed in the game through the years. What's up? Well, well I'm, I'm at Northport High School, which is in the South Sarasota County, uh, Southwest Florida area, and I'm going into my eighth season here at this school, and I've been I've been in, this is my 20th year in education down here in Florida, coaching and teaching. And, and really, if you consider my first year coaching as a voluntary assistant with uh, Coach Nealon's crew in 89, uh, I've been in the game as a, as a player and a coach for 40-plus years now and, and uh, 
it, I just, I'm down here. I work with kids. I, I work with uh, behavior kids uh, and uh, ESC kids and, and teaching and coaching and just, just loving the, just loving the life, man. Joe's was coaching always in the, in the plans for you? You know, Brad, when I got, when I got done, uh, I was so frustrated with the game just because of my physical uh, issues. And, and I, I just kind of totally got away from it. But I hurried up, called Coach Neal, and he said, get your butt back here, finish your degree, which I did right away. And, uh, and then I experimented, man. I was in the, the uh, manufactured home business. I tried a little bit of insurance. I tried, like, numerous different things. But, man, I'm not built like that. My nuts and bolts are football. And, and – you know, I love I love working with the kids and and uh, you know it's just a, it's a it's a fun time and and a connection was made through a guy and so he said hey West Virginia Wesley and a buddy of mine's the AD a guy named George Clevitz I called up there and I said hey what are you guys doing and I was in for an interview the next day and two days later I was a GA hired me on as a GA got my master's in education from Wesleyan and uh, coached there for eight years and then moved to Florida been down here ever since. Wow, I did not realize, Joe's, that you were that. I did not realize you were at Wesleyan for that long of a period of time for eight years. Yeah, I, yeah, I finished my master's in '92, and uh, and then I stayed when, when I, I finished in '91. So '92, I was hired on and was there until '98. Uh, moved down here in, in March of '98, and got and started coaching with Brad Matheny, right? Another Mountaineer legend uh, from from. Uh, He's Preston, from King, Preston, yeah, Preston West, County. Preston County. Here yeah, you go. yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so you know, it, it's just it's 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 wild how you look back on your life as you get older, and and you see all the different things that occur to put you in certain places at certain times. Man, it's 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 mind bending what what that good Lord's got us planned for. I, I promise you that it, it's it's a treat. Uh, and where I'm at right now is the best place to be. So, um, you know, life life's good, man. That's fantastic. You made reference a moment ago when your pro career came to an end. Coach Nealon said, come on over here and come back. So let's jump into that because I'm interested to know. I've never really asked you about it. You played 28 games in the NFL. You were the seventh overall pick of the draft by the Kansas City Chiefs. You played a bunch of football, and then you suffer a career-ending hip injury. Medicine has changed over the last bunch of years. Would would that still have been career-ending? What happened in that hip? Uh, you know, it, it was uh, a, a dislocation that uh, wasn't quite as brutal as the Bo Jackson injury, uh, but it occurred in training camp. Uh, going into my third season, and I I took a bad fall doing a drill, and uh, I lost about three weeks of mobility, and it was never the same after that. Later on, diagnosed as what they call a vascular necrosis, which is a, a condition when a blood supply is lost to bone, that bonehead dies, uh, and it and it pits out, it, it kind of craters, if you will. And uh, it was just an injury that uh, I just I, I couldn't bounce back from. I'd start feeling good going through therapies, and I'd go out on the field and do something and tweak it and be back to square one. And it just got so frustrating uh, at the very end of it. And and I can and then I got I finally got back on the field, and uh, we were out in L.A. Uh, playing the Raiders. And I got in a game, and I was doing something, and took a took, just took a bad fall. I think we were running a screen or something. I got out in the perimeter, and I fell on it, and uh, and that was it. I, I was sitting on the I never forget this, man. I was sitting on the the boxes right outside the locker room at the stadium, just kind of sitting there in my equipment because I knew that when I took that off, that was it. I was never going to put equipment on again. And uh, my offensive line coach, a guy named Carl Mock, uh, big old Carl, man, God bless him. He came up to me and he goes, hey, you all right? I said, Carl, I said, I'm done. He goes, yeah, I know. I know. Hey, it sucks, buddy. He said, but you know what? You're, you're 26. you got a whole lifetime ahead of you. And, uh, you know, that, that saying that to me really kind of 
you know, said, you know, everything will be okay. It's, it's going to, ain't going to be fun to, you know, get ready for some rough stuff. But and, and when it's all said and done, you'll be all right. And, uh, you know, sure enough, after the year was over, uh, you know, the Schottenheimer change took place and they were cleaning house. And of course I was one of the ones that was on that list and, uh, I got cut out and, uh, that's a story in and of itself, man. I swear, I walked in the locker room, and my name tag was already gone, and all my crap was in a freaking hefty garbage bag in front of my locker. See ya. How cold is that? Welcome to the NFL, baby. Anyway, so I got all my stuff, went and had a meeting with Schottenheimer, walked out the door. I was in the parking lot, and the first person I called was Coach Neal. I said, God. I said, Coach, I, I what am I doing? What do I do? I, well, I don't know what to do. And he said, Well, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna get your tail back here and fix this freaking degree. And um, and that was before the consortiums, that was before the, the all the when I came back to WVU, I paid for my hours, my credit hours, and I got my degree. Now they I think they still they'll they'll ask the if you go back to school as a, as a scholarship athlete, you got X number of years to finish it on their ticket, correct? Correct. That's right. That's correct. All right. Well, in, in, in 1989, uh, when I came back, that wasn't in place, and I paid my own way. And uh, I, was, uh, I, had, <laughs> I wasn't the best student. Uh, I did enough to stay eligible, with it, which, which is ridiculous because that's not enough to do anything. And uh, – I came back and I had to take like 41 hours. I had to I had to beg Dean Douglas to even let me try because he's like, "Come on, man!" You know, Tesla came back to school. He was here for two weeks and he quit. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I said, "I'm I'm not going to do that." I said, "I promise you." I said, "I got a family support. I got a lifetime." I said, "I got to do something," and uh, I had to I had to I had to really pry the thing open. And I think Coach Nealon may have made a good phone call for me. Anyway, I took like 40 hours in two semesters, and jammed through that. I was, I was on the dean's list. I got my diploma from WVU, which I owed them for what they – the opportunities that that program and those people have given me in my lifetime. I can, I'm indebted forever. And uh, to get that degree on my dime taught me one of the most valuable lessons in my adult life. And, uh, you know, it ain't over till it's over unless you say it's over. And, uh, you know, so I got back to school and got my degree, and off I went. So good stuff, man, good memories. You're in the very and, – and, and you know what, though? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but tough memories, too. I mean, that was – you know, I mean, I went about eight months after I got done out in, in, in the KC area, man, and, and I was a miserable human being for a long time because, you know, you're, you're programmed, you're, you're – you're used to doing certain things a certain way, and all of a sudden, it, it that that wrench gets thrown into the proverbial machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and wow. So anyway, but good stories and bad stories, but all part of who I am. And like I said, I'm I'm okay. Let, let's stay, I Joe. Guess. I don't know, Joe. Let's stay on that part for a little bit because I I think that's fascinating, and I think people underestimate what happens to guys. You're one of the very few people that was able to achieve that childhood dream, get to the NFL. There are, fewer le there are fewer still that are top 10 picks in the NFL. And then, as you just mentioned, all of a sudden, one day, it's just over and done. And I think people underestimate what that means when your identity changes and you're no longer this football player. Talk to us a little bit about that time. You're walking away from the game. You talk to Coach Nealon. Was there a lot of what-ifs? Were there years of what-ifs? How fast were you able to put that part of your life behind you? Uh, well, I tell you, the, the, one, the one piece that, that kind of – made it easy, it made it difficult, made it easy. The bridge, I guess, was the fact that it was an injury. Uh, it'd be one thing if I just, you know, really couldn't do it because I wasn't good enough or if, if circumstances were different, but, but the injury occurred and, and, and there it is. So you got to kind of develop a coping with that in and of itself. Uh, sure. What ifs? Absolutely. Um, shoulda, woulda, couldas, maybe. Absolutely. Uh, but you know what? Uh, you can't go back and change anything. You got to take. You got to take now, and and begin to you know try to formulate something. And that is a very difficult thing again because 
you're, you're, you have an identity. Uh, and it's almost, even even back in the 80s, man, it was like rock stardom. Are you kidding mm-hmm. me? Everywhere you went, uh, you know, the Mountaineers, uh, you know, college football was like that. You're, you're on a bus to a plane, to a great hotel, to awesome meals, to people banging on the side of the bus, to going in. Uh, I mean, you know, I got goosebumps just talking about it. Holy mackerel. And, and the preparation and, and the, um, the, the attention to detail and everything is scheduled out for you as a player, man. You know, all you got to do is look at your itinerary and be there. And, and, you know, and it's like bang, 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 bang. And you do that for so long. And you really, it, 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 it does bend your mind. That's why I respect those, those that, that can, you know, not get too caught up in that and, and, and be, uh, I think that's a lot of times the longevity of an NFL player is, is once you get past them first couple of years where you, you mature a little bit uh, and, and you get grounded a little bit better, do you really understand and, and truly appreciate the experience that you're actually living? And I've known a lot of guys, and me included, man. I ain't gonna lie to you. I went six, eight months where, uh, you know, I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. And if it wasn't for my wife at that time uh, saying, you know, that's it, we're done. You either you either get yourself up and, and get going. Uh, you know, it, it just you just gotta you gotta move past. You can't live in the past, and it's easy said, and, and, and but not as easy done for a lot. I got lucky. I had a good support crew around me. I had a young family I had to worry about, and uh, and there was there was a lot more uh, to me than just a football player. Uh, and, and I identify as a football player. I always will. I represent them wearing my West Virginia hat right now. I will, I'm a mountaineer. You cut me. I'm, I'm blue and gold. You guys know that, man. I, I mean, I, I can't say enough about that. Uh, but that's a chapter in, in my life. I, I'm, I'm what I am because of the products of all the experiences, great, bad, indifferent, whatever. Uh, you know, here I am. Yeah. And, and I remember all of it, uh, which I'm very fortunate that, you know, all the times I bang my head around, uh, you know, it's a wonder I can remember my phone number. Uh, but you know, uh, it's, 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 it's a challenge and a lot of them don't make it. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of them turn to really bad stuff. And, and that's why the NFL has such a great, uh, Burt Bell program, uh, transition programs. Now more than ever, there's more opportunities for post, uh, football than ever. And quite frankly, the money they're making, who the hell needs a job anyway? By the time you're done, you ought to have a hell of a bank, and you ought to be able to, to start your own business or, or philanthropy or do do something in that regard, uh, you know. Uh, so you know, hey, let me ask you this: is. along that lines, economically, just for the heck of it, I'm going to jump onto the, some other Morgantown stuff here. But what you sign for at that time? How how crazy has it gone from what it was to what it is? So you're the seventh overall pick. What was it? I had my contract was. Uh, valued at if everything was accomplished and I earned all the bonus that was involved in that, uh, it was uh, 1.25 over four years. <laughs> my, my base, my base salaries were like a hundred, hundred and nine thousand, hundred and ten thousand. My signing bonus was uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand, but. 500000 of that was this uh, some kind of a deferred loan that my agent got me involved with, which, by the way, if I ever meet him in person, I'll be on the front page of the freaking USA Today because they'll find him floating. Yeah, I remember uh, that. I remember yeah, I that, Joe. Oh, what a nightmare that was. Anyway. I, I remember. Uh, I, long I, story I, short, yeah. yeah, the money – the money that these guys, I mean, if I'd have got drafted last year as a seventh player taken, my signing bonus would have been about $18 million cash. Right, right. What that's what that? I think. Yeah, that's a good world. That's, that's a good world. That's a good world. It's, that's insane. You but mentioned it is what it is. Yeah. You mentioned that when you were here, it was rock star like. And I think that's a good way to put it because. Here's my perception of that time in Mountaineer football, and in particular, you. So Coach Nealon starts in 80. 
you guys get it cranked up. Um, they go six wins his first year, and then they go nine, nine, and nine. Nine wins, nine wins, nine wins. That takes us up to eight. So everything's set. And it, I mean, people are now totally into the Don Nealon administration, and this thing is cranked up. Well, here comes a guy out of Maryland, and he's massive in size. He's incredibly eloquent. You made fun of your you, you made fun of yourself academically, but you were like super smart. I mean, as you can speak right now, you you were always very very articulate. You embra you embraced that moment. You went you looked around a little bit. You could read the room and you go like, "I can have some fun here and it's I'm going to I'm going to do some things off the field as well." Here's my here's the memory that will never leave me. Here's the memory that will never <laughs> I'm leave me. Glad you're saying this because I was going to tell you to tell this story. Good. So, go. I don't know why I was I was on Patterson Drive, and it's like the middle of the afternoon, your senior year, and here comes a car from right to left from where the Coliseum is, heading toward the stadium. You're driving a convertible MG. <laughs> and that was a Triumph Spitfire. Triumph Spitfire. Okay, thank you. Triumph Spitfire. <laughs> Triumph Spitfire. And your head, your shoulders, and your head were above the windshield. And so, <laughs> is this like a Fred Flintstone it, type look? It looked just like Fred Flintstone. And he had the mohawk. And I like, and he goes, <laughs> drives down the road. And I went like, where else can you get that? I mean, so it was you, and it was Jack Kessler. Um, who was a backup lineman. You Both you guys, personality-wise, I mean, it was constant. And you had fun off the field as well. You'd go out and maybe have – heck, back then it was probably still 18. Probably had a – maybe had a beer or two. I don't know, just guessing out loud. But you had fun. It was – everyone was happy. Everyone was – it was like everyone was just enjoying the moment. That's kind of what I think. You were like organized chaos – you know, first of all, winning winning football games uh, does a does a number to a culture, and it lit a fire. Uh, you know, Coach Nealon and his staff that he amassed, and and all the guys that that bought into that were there and bought in, like the the Dennis Folks and the Daryl Tallies and the Todd Campbells and the Andre Gists and the Mark Rouse that weren't that were already there in place. They bought in. And he started recruiting that, that five-state area and pulling some, some talent with the sale that, guess what? You want to be part of something special? Sure, you can go to Nebraska or Penn State, story programs, great, whatever. You want to come here and be part of something really, really special? Get on board. And, and I was sold. When I, when I came on my visit, man, I was, I was blown away by the hospitality, the vision, the, the vision, knowing. That, that West Virginia was going to play for a national championship somewhere in the next decade uh, to be part of the, 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 the I don't, you can't say the foundation because the foundation has been being laid for a hundred years. Right. You know, foundation was laid with Sam Huff and Bruce Bosley and, 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 you know, Ira Rogers and, you know, the history of the game, but to be part of this new era, uh, you know, opening up the eighties, the decade and, and having this guy who, was so uh, easy to love. Uh, you know, he brought he brought his he brought his hitters with him. You know, you you loved Coach Nealon, but you know if Kerlab got pissed, look out. Uh, you know that kind of stuff. And and it was a, such a great blend. And when 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 we beat Florida uh, in in the Peach Bowl, and then come out neither neither game I played in. I didn't play in the Peach Bowl, and I didn't play in the Oklahoma game. But those two games were freaking breakout games from a nine and three season into what really put West Virginia onto the map and, and the explosion of excitement. It was it was. It was it was rock star to man. You, I couldn't go anywhere. It was man, and sign autographs, but my guy used to love that. I'd I'd sign autographs and thought I want anybody else standing there. Because I knew, <laughs> buddy, this this little window, this is only gonna be a little while. You better love it, man. You better enjoy it. And and you know, and then when Kessler showed up, you know, he taught me how to really push the envelope and uh get out of your comfort zone, so to speak. And I think that's what it took my game to a different level because 
in my mind, I mean, when I looked in the mirror, the guy that was talking back to me believed he was the best in the land. And nobody was going to outwork me, and, and nobody was going to outparty me, and nobody was going to take any of that away from me. I'm taking it with me when I leave. And and that's, you know, that's just the way it was. And it was an exciting time because, buddy, that you know, I don't care. 65,000, I know it's a big stadium, and it's got all this fancy schmancy stuff. But back in my day, when 70,000 people crammed into a 64,000-seat stadium, and they never – sat their butts in the bench and just freaking rocked. And and whenever I needed a little juice, yeah, I mean, I don't need much. But anytime I need a little juice, all I had to do, I swear to God, now maybe maybe it's in just in my head or maybe it was real. I don't know because a lot of times it feels like a fantasy sometimes. But I can remember throwing my arms up in the air and erupting that stadium into a freaking frenzy. Let's, I mean, all that, oh, God, I, I'm, shoot, man. No, you're right. I remember hey, it. You, you, were oh, a big, you were a big guy. He'd, you'd, you'd not only lift your arm, you'd always have the helmet in your hand, too. He'd give you the whole helmet. Oh, give you the whole helmet oh, going up, yeah. Man, I had, a, I had a little group of freaking frat dudes hung down in that, that lower end over where the bowl ended and the grass started, mm -hmm. and they always hung a big sheet. And it said, Joe's we had maniac. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and then freaking dudes, I could look over there, and I could just look at them, and they'd all stand up and go nuts, and then it would spread like a freaking forest fire. Oh, my God. And that's rock stardom, man. To have that kind of – I mean, I, I, I can't explain what they I, – I, I tell you what, I can explain it in one picture. I have a picture. We're playing Virginia Tech. I guess it was uh, – well, whatever, 84, 85, whichever one was home. And I'm coming out, and so, probably Dale Sparks snapped the picture. Now, when you see people running, all right, and you, and you freeze frame it, there's usually a foot on the ground somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I got a picture of me running in full stride, and both of my feet are about two feet off the ground. You were floating. It's, it's like floating oh, on air. It, it, it was. It would no. I was floating on the energy of the Mountaineer fans, and I was floating on the energy of the brothers that I ran out of that locker room with, who I knew had the same freaking feeling and the same desire and the same will that I had. And buddy, when we went to battle, look out, because because we were gonna we were gonna beat you up. At the end of the day, you're gonna feel like you were in a freaking string of car accidents. So I mean, that's just the way we played, and that's the mentality. That Co Coach Nealon was going to punch him in the mouth. <laughs> punch him in the mouth. <laughs> and I mean, you know, uh, and, and that's what we did. And and it was, a, it was a street fight when you played the Mountaineers. And we loved that because, you know, you show up, everybody thinks you're a bunch of hillbillies. You get off the bus, punch them in the mouth. You call me whatever you want me to call. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm a Mountaineer. There you go, buddy. Joe, you said something. Oh, you said something interesting yeah. there that I I think is missed by a lot of guys. Uh, they just don't have the ability to do this. You said there. You recognize there was a small window where you were living like this and playing like this and enjoying this. I think that's missed by so many people that play sports at the collegiate level or, quite frankly, even at the pro level. It, it's interesting listening to you and listening to Tony describe you. And obviously, I've, I've been around. 25 years here in this place so I, I've known about you forever you if if you were an athlete today they would say you were great at branding right they say you would have done a yeah. great job yes. at branding yourself but back then that that wasn't even part of the discussion were you cognizant of of that kind of image or were you just out having fun and that's part of what came with it you know uh when I shaved my head to a mohawk I did it for a, a lot of reasons and in the back of my mind, I'm sure that little voice said, this will draw some attention. Mm -hmm. But when you draw attention to yourself, uh, you best damn sight be able to, to back that up. So it put a lot of pressure on me because I knew they were talking about me. See, you got to remember now, the, the media has changed so dramatically over these 35, 40 years, and, and really drastic because back in my day, man, if you did a radio interview or if you were in the newspaper – it was something big and special. Now, because of all the media avenues and platforms and all this stuff, anybody can be a star. Hey, you know, hey man, I got a thousand followers. 
uh, you know, I do my thing. I, you know, I'm showing different ways of popping pimples, and I can be on freaking, I can be on a platform, and I got a thousand viewers. Oh, 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 oh. you know, back then, it was, it was more. You know, you didn't have cell phones. You couldn't, you couldn't take a picture with somebody, and it was spread out to thousands of people immediately. So, you know, you'd show up. You know, they used to call them Josuiac sightings. Hey, there was a Josuiac sighting because, like Tony said, I never went anywhere and hung out. When we went to we went to house parties, we we stayed behind closed doors because we knew, uh, first of all, we didn't want to hurt the program as best we could because you know, <laughs> we, you know, we didn't want to be that bull in a china closet, so to speak. So so we went behind closed doors, and back then you didn't have all this tech phones and stuff. Nah, you know, if you if if you do something, it's it's splattered out there. It's all over the place. So it was just a different era. It was a different culture. And when you walked into a pizza joint and there was 30 people in there, they'd be like, hey, look at that. That's, 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 that's mine here. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, God, what a rush, man. What yeah. a rush. And and to have that like that, uh, you're only going to get that for a short period of time, even at any level. I mean, you know, guys ride it for as long as they can. But... Uh, you know, for the vast majority of us, you got to be able to reinvent yourself because if you if you can't, yeah. then then you become a relic and uh, and it's too late. You know, you got to stay relevant. You got to you got to live every day. You got to find something that you can. I swear, and I mean this. I think it's important that that we're giving back and trying to help somebody that that needs the help that we need. That's what community does, man. Instead of stepping on somebody's fingers, you reach down, give them a hand, lift them up to where you are, and we can all climb the ladder together, so to speak. So, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Different times, man, different times. Yeah. Nowadays, I mean, you would be an absolute trip with social media. You imagine him, he'd be on Twitter, he'd be on Instagram, there'd be sightings, there'd be videos. And now, then throw in the fact name, image, likeness. Name, image, name, likeness. image, likeness, Joe. How, how about you know, some weight room videos from Joe's yeah. Weak back in the day? Bench. How much did you bench back in the day at the height, Joe's? What were <laughs> you? What were you hulking out there? That's when they would let them go full I know, board. That's when it was so big. What, oh, what, man. What'd you do? What, what'd you max single out? Single reps, man. We could do single reps. Uh, I did. Uh, I did like five fifteen, <laughs> and then I was going. We were going to go. We were going to go all the way up. Uh, Jack and I were, were going to push the envelope. And John Gay, uh, fullback, John yeah. Gay was in our threesome, and he blew his peck out. Uh, matter of fact, I was spotting him when he did it. Uh, and when that happened, that ended the single rep max. Al Johnson took us to a what was called a 3% max or something mm-hmm. like that back then, and, and we stopped doing single rep max. And, of course, you know, the single rep max was more of an ego thing than anything because it didn't know it didn't really translate to a football field. I mean, there's no time on the face of the planet you're only going to hit somebody once. <laughs> so, you know, hey Joe's, uh, so, I want yeah. I want to I want to talk weightlifting here because that obviously has changed dramatically from what you guys were doing back then to where we are now. I mean, now there's a science to it, and back then, you know. I remember Coach Nealon would come out in the mid '80s and say, "Hey, we're having a great summer. We've got you know 25 guys are here, 28 guys." And I mean, we're kind of dealing with that now as these guys try to come back in because of COVID-19. But there was an entirely different world of off season, and you guys lived it. Um, can you walk me through as you look back at your training because your strength? And by the way, Kessler. I don't think I've ever seen a bigger chest on anyone. That, oh, yeah. Have you Have you ever seen a bigger chest? In all seriousness, have you ever seen a bigger chest than Jack Kessler's chest? A uh, big John Stud. Yeah, be uh, about I, the I, only I, guy, I right? Next to Big John Stud. Uh, the uh, width Jack, was unbelievable. Oh, I wear I wear I wear a fifty six coat. If I'm gonna get a sport jacket. Jack wore like a sixty four. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, but his ankles looked like he was standing on two golf tees. <laughs> So, you know, he was all huge. But, You're right. You know, it, anyway, he looked like a big giant upside down pyramid. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> okay, so so bring me into your summer workouts because that's when the work was done. Looking back at that, 
That was a whole. Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the work started in winter conditioning. You know, you got to remember hours of how many hours I can have you. This was not existing. Okay, so when you, I mean, you worked out every day. Uh, we did the winter conditioning. We then we went into spring ball, and they used to give us a T-shirt if you could hit 20 days in a row. There was no this. We're going to practice today, and then we're going to take off two days, and, and then and then we're, we're not going to hit. We're going to we're going to wear pennies, and we're going to go out there and touch you on the backside hip. No, <laughs> ours was ripping people out of their shoes and ble- bleeding all over the place. And if you got a freaking t- you got a T-shirt, ah, I hit for 20. That's what it said. I hit for 20. But you know what? You know how many T-shirts they hung out? I, I bet they didn't give out 20 a year. Right. I mean, to, to make it 20 days was a freaking meat grinder. You and guys hit you got, every day. I mean, people, that's day. the one thing people don't realize. Two a days were two contact practices. You think of that now, and, and, and people say, well, no, no, no. Like, every day was like hit, goal line, hit, Goal line, inside run. You remember, you remember at the Push Car Center, which was on the facilities <laughs> building, between the first practice and the second practice after lunch, around the lobby, it looked like a triage center. There'd be fifty guys flying flat on their back trying to get a nap. Heck yeah, man! You wouldn't even take your tape off from the first practice. Just leave it on. Too much of a pain in the butt. Oh, it was crazy, man. But then, then you got you came out of spring and they gave you like. A week, and you went into uh, summer. Now, of course, I was there getting eligible every summer, so it didn't matter. I was going to be there anyway. But uh, we we are, see we got lucky. You know, you said something about being scientific. Al Johnson was that guy. A lot of a lot of what they do today derives itself from Al. Now, you got to remember, knowledge and technology push each other. So as, as, as knowledge pushes technology, technology affords new knowledge, and you become more proficient. Now it's a science tailored to the individual. They can tell you. They can put a diet together. They can, they can do things from a biochemical standpoint that enable the human body to do remarkable things beyond. Al was that cutting-edge guy. Uh, we were doing all kinds of training things. We were using rubber bands. We were doing uh, plyo work. We were doing things that were ahead of the times. Right. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, one of the best, one of the best strength coaching gurus, maybe in the history of, of college athletics. Uh, stellar resume he has, and uh, that's who that's who really trained us and got us to to do what we did. And and you know we just we just worked hard and we pushed each other. You know the coaches can push you. But when you're pushing each other, when it comes from within, that's when you really have something special. And, and that's what we had. And, and we would work. Uh, you know, we had our, our, our groups. And, and, man, we just uh, we wanted it. Because, again, we, we had those, those victories, those, those wins, those winning seasons. And, and, man, that feels good. Losing sucks. I don't care who you are. If, if you don't mind losing, then, then God help you. I wasn't taught like that. I like to compete. You got to learn how to lose, and you got to you got to use it to do something after, no doubt. Uh, but losing, losing sucks. Just and when you're winning, man, you feel it, and and that's what we had, and we just rode that ride, man. All right, along with the weightlifting, I'll, I always go back to this. One of my all-time favorite Sports Illustrated articles came a, a little bit after you got done playing '89. They profiled Tony Mandridge, the big offensive lineman from Michigan State, and they followed him into a grocery store and had his list of what he ate. And it was absolutely unbelievable what he put in his cart. We know today, Joe's, it's it's unlimited food for these guys when they're around the program. That was a big change just a couple of years ago. Take us back to that time, your size, no unlimited food. What were you doing for food? How much were you spending per week in food? What was the nutrition side of things for you guys? Well, again, you know, uh, in basic chemistry, it's it's basically, you know, how many calories you put in, how many calories you expend, what those calories are comprised of, period. And if you can get that pretty accurate, you know, knowing that, you know, your body's going to store either as muscle or as fat body weight, uh, which you need that, uh, you know, uh, 
if you if you take in more calories than you're burning off, you you end up storing some, and you can put some weight on like that. And that basic understanding and having a training table, you know, we had a training table. You go up there and eat. You want to eat? Eat. But but they also would weigh you every day. And if you started doing something that was they, they those guys would get in on you and and reduce, increase this, do that. So we were on the we were on we were right on the, the cusp of the nutritional understanding. You, you, you know, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so we ate. I mean, we ate. I, I drank. I, I mean, three mornings a week, I drank a dozen egg whites. Just drank them. Excuse me? Excuse, like, excuse me? You did what? I said three, to- three times a week, I drank out of a pitcher a dozen egg whites. I'd throw the yolk away because that's the cholesterol. Just straight? The, you the, just hammer that thing oh, straight? Yeah. Yeah, that's the grossest crap you ever drop down in your throat. Trust me. But you know what? What is it, man? It's protein. It's albumin. It's one of the truest, purest proteins on the planet because an egg is a cell. That cytoplasm, which is the that that good stuff, that juice, that our protein, I mean, man, that's good stuff, and it's clean, and it's and it was liquid, so it was in your system. You know, knowing stuff like that. Uh, yeah, we ate me and Jack, me and Jack and Brad. When we lived together, Jack's dad would show up with a, he had a restaurant up in Lincoln Air, and he'd show up with a trunk, and it'd have, you know, 60 pounds of bacon, <laughs> about 20 dozen eggs. And, you know, we'd eat that in two weeks. He'd have to come back with another truckload. Oh, it was brilliant. Man. See, Tony, that's, wow. the, that's the stuff, if you had that today, you'd, you'd pop that baby on Instagram, right? He'd pop that trunk with all those eggs, and that's a great Instagram picture right there. But here's the deal. Oh. Back then, you were on your own. Yeah, you had training table in season. Back then, in the summer, you had to fend for yourself. They weren't feeding you in the summer. Nowadays, yeah. if everything it's was limited no- food, right? If That's everything the point. was normal, yeah. they, these guys would go in there and get in the way it, the way that it should be. Oh. I want to. Wait, wait a minute! You go in there now. They got protein bars. Yeah. And, and I'm not talking about a protein bar in a package. I'm talking about a bar. <laughs> yeah, right. With protein shakes and this and that. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Oh yeah, it's 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 good living. I want to ask you about the eighty. I want to ask you about the eighty four season. Start off seven and one. You beat Ohio. You beat Louisville. You beat Virginia Tech. There's a story there as well. You lose to Maryland twenty to seventeen. Then you win four in a row at Pitt, Syracuse, Boston College, Penn State. Those games that folks won't forget. Everyone gets hurt. You lose at home to Virginia. Get pounded twenty seven seven at Rutgers. You lose 23-19 at Temple. Have an offsides issue on a field goal. Temple gets a second try. They beat West Virginia 19-17. That's November the 17th, last game. Six weeks go by. Mountaineers get healthy. You go to the Blue Bonnet Bowl. You beat TCU 31-14. Recollections of the 84 season. Oh. Well, I mean, you know, you started off with the with the seven and one, and the one that we lost that Maryland game. I think there was an offside at the end of the game that gave them another kick. Otherwise, we would have went overtime and we'd have beat them as well, uh, if I if I'm recollecting correctly. But yeah, we were seven and one, ranked fourth in the nation, and riding an incredible ride. Our locker room was 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 chemistry. We were just we were we were hitting it, man, on all eight cylinders, but. You know, when we went Boston College, Penn State back to back, and that Penn State game was a freaking battle. Oh my God! Uh, and and the, both of those games, we were just beat up uh, defensively. Primarily, we had a lot of young guys filling positions and doing the best they could, but didn't have the experience and or the the age to compete with those teams. And, and you know, in in like two weeks, if you think back to that time, it was wild because. You know, we lost that Virginia game, and they had a hell of a quarterback, and they did some good things, and, and they beat us. You know, but then you lost to freaking Rutgers. Come on, man. You got to be kidding me. And Temple? What? We didn't even – you know what I mean? And, yeah. and in just a matter of a couple of weeks, our locker room fell apart. We were we were blaming each other. We were we were uh, pushing and shoving on the practice field. It, 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 was, it was tough. It was tough. Because man, we should be playing for a national title, and we're not. And and, and it's because it, 
did, 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 did. And all these excuses started flying. And i never forget this. I swear to God, we came in for a meeting when the season was over. And, you know, we get this bowl bid from the Blue Bonnet Bowl. And Coach Nealon came into that auditorium, and uh, he basically dismissed all his assistant coaches. Y'all get out. And he directed this to us, and he basically said, look, here's the deal. Uh, we, we got a bowl bid. You know, we, uh, you guys did good enough, and they know we travel great. Uh, we got this bull bid in Texas, uh, but I'm not. I'm not taking you guys anywhere, as you are now. Ain't doing. It. If we're gonna go, we're gonna go work. We're gonna put in the work. We ain't going down there to fool around and party. We're gonna go. It's gonna be training camp. We're gonna get back. We're gonna get healthy, and then when we go to Florida, or wherever the hell, Texas. When we go to Texas, you're gonna have your your act together. And it's going to be work. So if you want to do it, let me know. And he said another couple choice things, and he walked out. Now you got to remember now that we had all kinds of stuff going on. We had they said what was outside of our locker room. They they said we had racial problems going on. We had fights in the locker room. There was all kinds of rumors flying around. We never got to that point. We just broke down into little groups of people instead of one big nasty locker room. And when Coach Nealon left, I swear, I think it was Freddie Smalls, uh, preacher, Freddie Smalls, man. He was the first one to stand up because there was silence. Nobody said nothing. We just sat there going, what the hell just happened? And uh, Freddie kind of stood up and said, who knows? Uh, but, you know, what are we doing? Are you kidding me? We got a chance to go show the world. And... Uh, and in just a matter of a few seconds, we were in the middle of that little auditorium, just all hugging each other and let's go, let's, you know, screw these people kind of thing, let's go. And uh, our seniors went in there and told Coach Nealon, and we went down to, to Texas on a high school football field, and, buddy, it was like training camp. I mean, we had tight curfews. Uh, we had a couple of nice things that we did. Hell, I ate a bunch of jalapeno peppers and uh, got sick and died. And, and just, it was a great time. But when we went to work, buddy, we went to work. And it was the real deal. And Russ Jakes had a game plan that was off the charts. And we came out there and threw the ball to Gary Mullins yeah. in the opening freaking drive and scored and never looked back. Yeah. Broke Kenny Davis's leg. Yeah. I think Derek Christian hit him so hard on the sideline, broke his leg, take him off the field. Goodbye. And and we just sent a message, man, to to that whole that whole nation, man. You know, we were banged up, but we ain't never out of it. And and it, it was that was great. That's what I remember. That and of course, you know, beating Penn State. Holy crap! I, I mean, that I've never I, to this day. Uh, I, I I recollect, you know, four quarters of football. Nobody ever sat down. It was the loudest. I mean, thirty eight seconds left on the clock. And, and Paterno's tucking his tail and, and running for dear life because our goalpost is torn to the ground already. <laughs> <laughs> what are you kidding me? It's pandemonium. Yeah. I love it. Beautiful, man. Great memory. Yeah. Great, that, that, whole, that whole experience. And, and I'll tell you, the, the biggest part of it, the lesson learned, is, is, you know, when you get the more people that get behind and push, I mean, if we're all pulling in different directions, we ain't going anywhere. But if we all get behind and push, we got a chance. And, uh, you know, Coach Neal taught us that stuff, man. Lifelong. Lifelong lessons. One of your lifelong commitments has been to help WVU and WVU Children's Hospital. You've got the 30th, the 30th anniversary of your annual golf tournament coming up. Why did that start and why has it lasted so long? So many of these events just kind of pitter out. I think it's the, the tenacity uh, of, of battling for kids. Uh, that's our that's our next group. You know, I got to do a lot of wonderful things. That that was the message again. I credit Don Neal and, and more more probably his his uh, his missus there, uh, Miss Mary Ann Nealon, who had a, 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 a wonderful connection with the kids over there. And Coach Nealon started taking us over on home games Fridays three o'clock. We'd get in a van drive over and, and walk in and out with our jerseys and meet kids and brighten them up a little bit, and talk to them. And they didn't care who you were, but you were a Mountaineer football player, and, and that was enough. 
and uh, you'd see a kid with tubes sticking all in them, you know, uh, and smiling at you, uh, and and see their family sitting there, and and what that meant to them, and and that that just ingrained to me, you know, no matter what, man, stay on the ground as best you can because it can be a lot worse really fast, and uh, you know, coach coach Nealon, I, I credit that, and then when when I got done and I came back. You know, I knew I was going to be around a while, and, and I wanted to do something that would be, you know, it would help with awareness because we knew it was there, but everybody else kind of didn't. You know what I mean? Peggy Myers had just come on as the development coordinator, and, uh, you know, we all got together, and I went to them and said, hey, I'd like to do this. And uh, Scott Sears, who's been my partner in crime since day one, uh, he had a little restaurant over in Fairmont, and we put this thing together. The first annual is Windsor's Celebrity Golf Classic. And, buddy, it's evolved over these 30 years. But, you know, it, it's it's the participation, first of all, that, that makes it go. The participation of, of the athletes, the former players that come back. You know, Coach Nealon's our, our, our main guy. He's the, the honorary chairman. He comes in it and have all these people involved. And people come to play and they support it. And, you know, I mean, we've got a couple of groups that have been there all 30 years. And businesses have come and gone, and new new faces have come in, and and others have faded. But it just keeps it's just it's it keeps perpetuating. And and uh, you know I, I I'm not an ego guy. I, I try not to be. I try to stay humble and grounded. But it, it's it's an honor because I feel like a lot of these people want to come hang out with me for a day or two, and I think that's freaking. There is no other way to honor. Or, or appreciate somebody than to want to be around them for a minute. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a lot of people I'd love to have ha- had a little bit more time to be around just because of what it is. And uh, and and so here we are, uh, 30 years later. Man, it, it's it's just it's it's cool. It's awesome. And and it's become an alumni thing. A lot of guys show up and and come hang out. We get you know 30, 30, 35 former players, uh, and I call them legends. Every one of them whether you were an All-American or, you know, a third-team guy giving me the look, uh, they're all legends in my mind, especially Mountaineer legends. And uh, we get together and and we raise some money. We have some entertainment. We have some fun. And, uh, you know, more than anything is is we make sure that that we're we're still giving back. Uh, You know, like I said, I'm I'm forever indebted to WVU for what they did for me, how they hung in. I mean, they could have kicked me to the curb numerous times, and and they didn't. Uh, you know, they they hung in there with me, and by God, I'm hanging them. I'm hanging with them until my end. That's for dag on shore. So, Brian, Brian, real yeah. quick, what the so, the date this yeah. year again is when, and how do people get some more information or contribute if they'd like to? Uh, we're uh, okay. The date got moved. We're, we're June ninth, Thursday. June 9th at you Tropics mean, out there at you mean, Lakeview. You mean July 9th? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, July 9th. Yep. I'm sorry. Yep. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I was I was back. It was scheduled in June, of course, because of all the issues. We'd had to move it and uh, and and do some modifications and you know make sure in, with, with where all the CDC codes and all that, we're ready to go. Uh, uh, July 9th, which is a Thursday night, we're at Tropics. We do this thing. We tied in with Hostetler and his foundation you know, raising money for the top floor of this new children's hospital, as you guys see it, right. uh, growing and developing. And, I mean, all the metal, all the frameworks done there, I mean, it's going to be something special. The top floor, uh, Haas is spearheading this this drive. Uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, a, a WVU locker room, a place where the kids and the families can go and hang out and, and all that. And it's going to be really interactive and, and a special place to be. And it's, and it's allowing... Uh, former Mountaineer athletes uh, from all the sports to be involved and, and, and you know, have that as our stamp uh, for the kids. Uh, Thursday night, that's an auction. Uh, Marshall Lowry Band plays. It's a, it's a great time we have. We got some food, and, and we visit, and, and we raise some money, and then Friday's the golf tournament uh, out there at Lakeview. Uh, we still could probably take a couple more teams. It's a six-man scramble. It's a trip. It's, it's one – I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you who won last year. No, I can't. I'm only but you know, I mean, it's it's more of a gathering. I mean, we we get together. It's it's a trip. It's a lot of fun. We have a good time. And then this year, because it's the thirtieth, 
and we got all these guys in. We're doing the first annual Cheat Lake Sink or Swim Regatta. <laughs> that ought to be a trip. That's Saturday morning. Saturday morning. So it's a it's a good full weekend, uh, you know. And and we're gonna we're we're celebrating a little bit for the milestone, and and you know us all getting old and and still here, able to to participate in it. You know, we're gonna have some fun. We got you could go on, like Facebook. You can go to. I have a, a nonprofit called Joe's Nose Kids, J O Z N O Z K I D Z, Joe's Nose Kids, and that's our vehicle that we use for this golf tournament. We established it. Oh, it's been probably eight, ten years ago, and and that's our our uh, our nonprofit that that handles the golf tournament. Uh, you can you can go. Uh, you can call Lakeview. They got all the details. Uh, you know. And if you just want to come hang out, uh, you know, come to, come to Tropics, you know, buy a ticket. Can't remember even what the ticket cost is, but we're selling tickets at the door. Come in, hang out, meet some Mountaineer legends, and and have some fun. And and you know, uh, it's gonna be a good time. Awesome, it's gonna be a good time. Absolutely fantastic. Hey, by the way, let me mention this. Yes. Let me just say one more thing. Sure. Pat Randolph, and I'm saying this because he, I just talked to him. He committed. Oh, good. Uh, Pat Randolph uh, is gonna be. He's gonna be back and participate and he's never been to one and you know, of course he's a coach and, and does his thing so it actually being in july he can come be part of it he's the one that ran the great run in the yeah. penn state game that put us ahead and uh and win that thing so absolutely ah, anyway absolutely right around hey, the, right around the old right you. side right around the old right side yeah, running right. right toward the hospital joe's right toward the hospital right, right behind scott burrow exactly <laughs> exactly oh. Hey, thanks for taking me down memory lane, guys. No, thank you. We sincerely appreciate it. We uh, hope you guys have a wonderful time coming up here in a couple of weeks when you come back up for the event. Stay safe. Stay well. Hope you guys have a great uh, season down there, and we look forward to seeing you, buddy. Thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate you, man. You all stay well and healthy, and uh, I'll see you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. There he is, Brian Joswiak, the one, the only Brian Joswiak. How good is he? character how good is he great we knew he would be we knew he would be we knew he would be and like we said what would he have been like if all the different platforms existed when he played you know he said something um when he said i called coach neil in in the kansas city chiefs parking lot like that's right when cell phones started I mean, that was the very, very beginning. Early, early. Yeah, that was like, he was, it was probably as big as a roll of paper towels back then. But, I mean, you got to think, so there was none of that there back at that time. So it was like spotting. <laughs> it's like, hey, Joswiak, last night was down Sunnyside. Those guys were down at Sunnyside. It was a different time, man. Well, like we talked about there, the, the branding wasn't a term or known. But talk about what that guy's done from a branding perspective and staying connected yes. to WVU and the state in general. I mean, you can hear it in his voice how much it means to him. But he is one of the all-time greats at staying connected even though you're not living in this state some 40 years later. 100% right because think about this. It's 36, 30, well, since his last 35 years. Right. 35 years. Right. And people say, Brian Joswiak. And they still know who he is. And he wasn't a quarterback. He wasn't no. a running back. Lineman. He wasn't a receiver. He was a lineman. So that the branding that he did, intentional or otherwise, is yeah. absolutely remarkable. His heart has always been in that. The golf tournament, obviously, just keeps sure. every year he gets a he gets a spot in 35 years later. That's a great story. I mean, you talk about the student-athlete experience, something else that I thought was really, really super interesting. He came back and paid yeah. for his degree. This was before the university athletic department would – Keep, keep your clock going so that you could come back and get your degree. He paid. Here's the guy that was a consensus All-American. Seventh pick in the NFL Seventh draft. Seventh pick in the draft. He had to pay when he came back. And that's why a lot of people back then did not come back and do it, didn't have the financial resources to do it. He did. Leads to a master's degree. Now his life is devoted education. to education. Yeah. And he goes after kids who are special needs kids. And that's what he does. And he's still coaching football down in Florida. All right. We invite you to uh, share the word on this particular podcast. And a reminder that we are getting closer to football. Did you know, did you see recently, that the recreational vehicle business is skyrocketed, has skyrocketed this over the last year? Why? Well, you got to stay kind of, right? Social distancing. You can social distance in an RV. 
and our good friends at Burdett Camping Center have the doors open. Service department's open. The dealership is open. You name it, they make it. They've got it. And their three guys special is an off-the-chart deal. And here's what it is. It's the 2020 Van Lee Beacon by Tiffin. It's a fifth wheel. It is a 42 RDB is the model number, 42 RDB. And this thing is just absolutely super gorgeous. You can do whatever it is that you want to do inside this thing. It's awesome. TVs, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm going a little bit too far if I say it's got an elevator. It probably doesn't have an elevator, but you know what it does have? It has Burdett Camping Center and their warranty forever, warranty forever opportunity with everything that they sell. So check it out. They've got the three guys special going right now. They've taken $24,000 off the retail price. It was one forty one four now one seventeen two. Check it out. Go to their website, BurdettCamping.com, BurdettCamping.com. They're located in Winfield. Check them out, and you'll have yourself a big time. Still getting good reaction, by the way, on the uh, text line to the Jake Kelchner deal. And someone texted us the picture. Remember when Jake said, I once got hit so hard in the Virginia Tech game that the football stuck to me? Yeah. It was Cornell Brown. That made the hit. Cornell Brown from Virginia Tech lines up on the right side of the line and is untouched. And he goes straight, like like a heat-seeking missile, right into Jake's back. Jake's rolling the opposite way. The guy goes straight in untouched. Got a little head snap there. Got a head snap, got everything, and and Jake got the ball impaled um, on him. Uh, Adam says... Love listening to the show, especially the ones with past players. It would be great to hear some shows with former players from when I was a kid, like Herbie Brooks or Dale Blaney. Keep up the great work. Two of those guys would be great. Both would be very good. I'm going to tell you right now, just confirm before we started to record today, our next guest. I like this one, too. I like this one a lot. Great story. Michael Baker, the touchdown maker. <laughs> From Waverly, Georgia. Great nickname. Michael Baker, the touchdown maker. Awesome career. Awesome story. Came in as an academic non-qualifier. That's when you would come in and be ineligible and left graduating with honors and has had a great career. So we're going to talk with Michael Baker, the touchdown maker, on our next episode of Three Guys Before the Game. And by all means, you can continue to uh, make suggestions. Had a good run. Again. Good run. Joe's was great. Darius was great, the last one. You know, some people criticize me for rushing summer. They say that I get on this bandwagon where I say, you know, June 20, 20 or 21, whatever. Right in that range. It's whenever summer starts, that the days start getting shorter. Mm-hmm. So they accuse me of doing that. I would be on that side of things with people that criticize you for that. I don't want to be to quicken this summer, but I was thinking this – this weekend so mike baker's booked for next week okay i think that only leaves us one more show in june then four in july yeah and back to football we got five of these and we're done well we got a lot to still do i know i know because we're out there trolling for a couple fish that are that are big we got to get this we got to get some social distancing stuff taken care of but yes you're right so anyway, it's going to happen fast. All I'm saying is let's enjoy each and every second. Did you get out there this weekend and enjoy? I did. The, uh, by the way, this morning, the sun, I, don't, I've never, I haven't seen this happen before. Um, the sunrise was supposed to be to like 640. Mm-hmm. For some reason, it, 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 like it forgot. It forgot. And like 617, it just went poof. Just popped. popped. Out. Just popped out. I'm going like, wait a second. You're not supposed to be up yet. Yeah, see, this weekend was really good too because it wasn't it wasn't overly hot. Yeah. In fact, for a little bit, it was a little bit cool. Oh, last night was a little weird. Yeah, Saturday was yeah, a little last, bit cool last too. Night, last, whoa, 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 excuse me, hit the music too loud. Uh, last night was a little bit, yeah, chilly, but that's fine. That's fine. It's going to get nice, and we're going to get in the 80s, and as they say, do this, do that. All right, three guys before the game. You all right? Do this, do that. You all right? Okay. Three Guys Before the Game is brought to us by Comax Business Systems. They are your full-service Konica Minolta dealer. Go to Comax Business Systems at ComaxWV.com. And by Burdett Camping Center, 
the only warranty forever RV dealer in all of West Virginia. Check them out at BurdettCamping.com. Very special thank you to Brian Joswiak, Mountaineer Hall of Famer, Consensus All-American, and just a good dude for joining us on the program. Spread the word if you would. If people may not have heard about it yet, share it with them. Say, hey, you got to listen to this as we continue to grow, grow, grow. Episode 212 in the book for the Senator and our producer, Daniel Woods. We're out. Have yourself a good day. Take care.